Hey friends, welcome back to the Breakthrough Brand Podcast. I have a special treat for you today. So this is an interview I did with Becky Hoshek on her podcast, Beyond, which is a show for moms called to business. Becky and I have known each other for ages because she was actually one of my first template customers. And then I was one of her first life coaching clients. And then she also has done mindset coaching inside of Book.Designer for Book.Designer students. So we've been around each other a while. We've gotten to hang out in real life. And I just really love Becky. And I loved this episode so much that I asked her if I could share it with you guys on here. And with Mother's Day right around the corner too, I thought this would be a great episode because we do talk about motherhood and business stuff a lot. Although I'll say we talk about plenty of other things things as well if that topic doesn't interest you. But you'll hear us discuss things like my business backstory, how I make money online, a time in my business where I felt like throwing in the towel but didn't and how I dealt with that, how I merge having a more systems related brain and a creative brain, trying things and being okay with failure. We talk about mom life and work schedules and business before becoming a mom and business after becoming a mom. We talk about how my faith impacts my business and so much more. It's a really great episode where we cover all sorts of things. And another note before you listen in, this episode originally aired at the end of 2023. So a while ago, right? So I talk about things like only having one child. I was pregnant at the time. So I talk about planning my maternity leave for baby number two. And also not having my course yet, Podcast Success Blueprint. So when Becky asked me like how I make money in my business, I don't mention that. So it was a slightly different season of life. And now as you're listening to this, me recast this, and I'm recording this little intro for you, um, I'm on maternity leave with my second precious baby boy. And like I said, I have another offer in my business besides what I mentioned in this episode, which is Podcast Success Blueprint. So anyway, just wanted to make that note that some of those like really specific life details are a little dated. Um, so if you're loving this episode, Becky will be back on the podcast in a few short weeks where I'm interviewing her. So stay tuned for that. And then also be sure to check out Becky's podcast beyond for more great interviews and solo episodes from Becky. We will link to that in the show notes. And I really just hope you enjoy this conversation. Hey guys, I'm Elizabeth McCravey, an online educator for entrepreneurs, website designer, wife, boy mom, and your host for the Breakthrough Brand Podcast, the show that's all about pulling back the curtain on how to actually build a successful business. I don't skim the surface around here. If you want to dive deep into the nitty gritty details of what it takes to run a sustainable business that fits your unique lifestyle while standing out in a crowd, then you are in the right place. I created a multiple six figure year business in my early twenties. And now in my thirties, I'm still running that successful multiple six figure year business on just part-time hours now as a working mom. I'm here to share everything I've learned and everything I'm still learning because I believe that the keys to building a thriving business should never be a secret. Here you'll find episodes that are actionable, direct, and fun, like friends chatting business over coffee and a fresh, honest take on the reality of being an entrepreneur. If you're ready to master online marketing, website design, personal branding, mindset, time management as a busy parent, scalable and passive income, and business strategy, then this is the podcast for you. It's time to build your breakthrough brand. Let's do this. So you said you've been in business about eight years and I remember you started your own business pretty early, right? What led you to, you know, after finishing school thinking like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to yeah. do my own thing and start my own business. Yeah. So I was not wanting to start my own business actually at first. I, after graduating college, I was interested in starting a business at some point, but I saw that as like, for 30 year old Elizabeth to do not like 21 year old, 22 year old Elizabeth. And so I got a job at, um, it was like a pretty corporate job at an advertising place here in Nashville where I was doing design mm -hmm. and marketing, like at an ad agency. And I was super stoked about it. Um, the job only lasted like four months for me because I quit. Um, and kind of was hoping when I quit actually to like have time and I'm going to, you know, find another job in these 30 days as I'm going to be noticed, but ended up leaving 
leaving that same day. And during that time, I was still not thinking about starting a business. I was like, I'm going to find another nine to five. And I was just applying for jobs, applying for jobs. And at that same time, I was freelancing a lot. And that really picked up for me. And that's kind of how I started my business. So it wasn't, I did have a moment eventually where I was like, hey, I am starting a business. This is officially a thing. But for a while, it was kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm doing these clients. I got these clients. I don't have a website yet. I don't have a professional email. And I'm kind of just building this up. And oh, wow, I'm making money now. Maybe I should pursue this instead of waiting for someone to get back to me about another job. So many people, especially in those really early stages of business, I think one of the big questions is like, okay, if I have a website and I have this and I have these pieces, like, but how do I get my first clients? What was that like for you? Did you reach out to like your personal network when you started freelancing? What was that like? Yeah, it, it's so fun thinking back about that time because it's so special, those first clients. And I know when you're in the moment with it, it can feel like you just want the client and you want them to be amazing. You already want to be like making money like you've been in business longer. But yeah, I look back on that time really sweetly. But for me, I got... So it is very random different places. One of my biggest clients at the time when I first started my business was a local um, horse race, actually, that's like been in Nashville for, gosh, like over 40 years. It's like a true tradition here, a big, big event every year. And I made that connection through someone at church who like literally I just told her. I'm a, what do you do for a living? I'm a graphic designer. Oh, we need a designer. We'd love to talk to you about that. And that's how that came about. Um, I also found yeah. jobs through Upwork, which I really okay. think is a good site for getting started on, um, or staying on longer. I know people mm-hmm. who make great incomes off of there, but that was a good place for me to, cause you can like apply for jobs. So people have their job listings and all kinds of creative fields. And I could see one that makes sense for me, fill an application. So I got a lot of clients that way as well. And then some other local businesses that I was just managing social media for going back to like people I'd been working with in college. Okay. So did you do like social media management while you were a student? I did at the end of school. So I interned my between my sophomore and junior year at a PR agency in San Diego where their thing is actually like influencers, which is really cool because when I was working there, influencer stuff was so new and kind of like unheard of, but we yeah. were on the brand side and sending products to influencers and things like that. Now they work like they represent influencers. But um, I had some clients that I kept with from that internship, basically, and then more got added. So I actually started my business as a social media manager. Um, And I thought at one point that that would be what I'd kept doing. And then ultimately, when I was I was doing like a mix of design and that but that was more of my income was Mm -hmm. the social media management. And I realized I like design more and then made that pivot to like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Then eventually got into like, okay, I like websites the best within that. Yeah, okay, awesome. It's so fun. Like that journey of like figuring out how those pieces fall into place is so fun to hear in other people's stories. So thanks for sharing that. Um, So when it comes to today and what the business looks like and how you get paid, I know there are several different pieces to that puzzle. So tell us what Elizabeth McCravey's dot com, I guess (laughs) it looks like today. Yeah. So my, when I look at like, okay, what if I were to like get out my P and L, the things would be templates at the top. And I have a lot of different show templates from like the you know, f- full entire websites to smaller add-ons. So all of those is one of my, like I see all its own product. And then I have booked out designers. So that would be the next thing, which mm-hmm. is my online course. And then other things in my business, I have like one smaller product called Profit Sheet. And then I also make money as an mm-hmm. affiliate with just different software companies I work with and you know, promote because I use them and love them, which is a really just like fun thing to get to do as a business owner and having a platform like a podcast and blog and things like that can really help you make money there. And then another source of income that's a different business is my husband and I do real estate investing. So we have five properties in Middle Tennessee, one in Alabama. So five total, but mostly in Tennessee, one in Alabama that are investment properties. And so that's another business and its own LLC. And I don't do as much for that. My husband mainly does that, which is nice because I feel like I have my hands full with my business, but that's a fun like project (laughs) we do together. Yes. 
at this stage, do you ever do one-on-one work, one-on-one design work for clients anymore? I will. So I will. It's so tough. I, I forgot to say, I do one-on-one business coaching. That's another product that's like in there. Um, so that's been more of like in the last year, the one-on-one work I have done. I, it's so tough for me because I want to keep doing one-on-one work as a designer. And I do get inquiries about that often. And I do some things for past clients who come back. But right now, just in this season of life, which I know we're going to talk about like seasons of life and seasons of business, but mm-hmm. financially, it hasn't made sense for me because I'm working yeah. not that many hours. It's like my hours are best spent focusing on these different products, but I don't want to never do that again. Like I want that to be a part of my business. So I'm thinking like it will be basically a bigger part again at some point. Yes. yes. So, okay. Awesome. Okay, so I shared with you and we chatted a bit about this before we hit record, but um, one of the things I love about your approach to teaching and just the way that you show up in the business world and even how you share content on your podcast is how you're just very open and like to be real and transparent. And I think that that is so valuable, um, especially in a world where Um, not everyone does business that way. And there can be a lot going on behind the scenes in businesses that you never really see or learn or hear about. So I love that. And it led me to want to ask you a very real business question, because a lot of times people out there are celebrating their wins and, you know, sharing the highlight reel of everything that's going on. But we know that in reality, that's not 100% of what it looks like to run a business. And so I was wondering if you would share with us maybe one of those not so mountaintop moments that you've experienced in business where maybe you tried something new and it didn't work or didn't go as you had expected or did something differently or pivoted and tried something new and the outcome was very different than you thought it would be or hoped it would be. Yes. And I was telling you before that like, I usually have a story that I always tell with this about creating pre-made brands years ago before my template shop, before anyone was ready for a product for me when I should have just kept doing custom work. But I have a new version of that kind of story that's um, way more recent. And we were just saying that I have a podcast episode that at the time we're recording just came out. It's 223 of the Breakthrough Brand Podcast. But I share all about Mm -hmm. this. But basically last year in 2022, I started a membership site and I, it was not, um, it was very well thought out. So it wasn't like a, oh, I'm just going to do this. Like, let me just do it, move quick. This sounds like a good idea. Mm-hmm. It was very th- well thought out. And I thought it was a good move for me in my business. And I had a lot of really logical reasons why I spent months working on it, preparing it. And ultimately, I think I made a lot of mistakes creating it. It wasn't a great offer. And I closed it about four months later. Um, and, you know, refunded okay. or gave a different offer option to people who paid in full, canceled everyone's subscription. I left the Facebook community up for all the members. So, like, I kept creating content and being active in there. But it was a really hard thing. And it was, like, a hugely hard decision when I was in that time of, like, okay, do I keep it open as it is? Do I change this thing about it to make it more sustainable and make it a better offer? Do I just close it? And it was just so overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd look back at that time my business is like, I was pretty like, it, it was pretty stressful because I was just like, I, I, it's just like, what do you do? And there were, there were right answers mm-hmm. everywhere. Um, any of them really could have worked, but I'm ultimately really glad I just closed it because I think that was the right thing for me. But that was a like, it internally a low point, even though it was going well, because um, I had 170 people join. So it wasn't like the membership itself flopped or anything, but I wasn't like satisfied with what I was offering. And it was like, memberships are just a lot. It was more than I think I was anticipating, Um, especially with that many people. It was like, there's a lot of people to serve and things to do. So... Interrupting this episode with a suggestion for the small business owners listening. Ever wonder what you should do for healthcare when you and your spouse are both self-employed so there's no work-provided health insurance to participate in? 
Well, when my husband Adam joined me in the entrepreneurial job space over four years ago, we joined Christian Healthcare Ministries instead of getting traditional health insurance. And it was the best decision for us, especially in these years of growing and raising a family while also running multiple businesses. CHM is a health cost sharing ministry and is a faith based alternative to health insurance. We did tons of research before choosing CHM. And if you know me and Adam, you know we are all about doing the math when making big or small financial decisions. And even though it's not insurance, CHM shares 100% of eligible medical bills, which is more than the typical 70 or 80% of medical bills paid for by insurance companies. All sharing is determined by the CHM guidelines, which you can check out before and after joining. And for the mamas and mamas to be listening, you truly cannot find a better healthcare option for maternity care. I had a vaginal delivery and a C-section and birth center care and hospital care between my two pregnancies and births, and it was all 100% shared for. And outside of birth, we've had our share of emergency room visits and procedures as a family, and those costs were all shared by members at Christian Healthcare Ministries, leaving us only paying our monthly contribution. CHM is less expensive month-to-month than insurance, and because there's no network, you can choose your care with whichever providers best fit your family. I seriously just cannot recommend Christian Healthcare Ministries enough. You've got to check them out. Go to elizabethmccravey.com slash CHM for more information. Also putting that link in the show notes, elizabethmccravey.com slash CHM. Now back to the episode. At what point in the process after launching the membership, what kind of took place to open your eyes to like, oh no, like, I don't think this is going, this isn't what I thought and what am I going to do? Yeah. So I feel like it's so crazy. I hate saying this, but it was really quickly, which is like the worst when you're like, and that's why it's like, you know, I say I closed after five months. It's like, okay, I took action quickly on that, realizing that it was not a good fit. But yeah, it was very quickly I realized the scope of what I was selling was very intense for the price point. And that was really challenging for me. Like it was so much content, so many coaching calls, so much time in this community creating content and even having like team members helping me. I'm like, this would make sense if this was my only offer, but I also have these other offers yeah. that need attention. Um so yeah, pretty quickly I realized that that something needed to change. And I did actually make some changes to it immediately from that realization. And that was good and helpful. But then ultimately I was like, I don't want to keep doing this. And I just think at least in my season of life that like membership is not a membership site's not for me, um, which not to say it's not for yeah. other people. Cause I get that that can be a great business model, but I realized that I really like other types of digital products better, like courses and like templates and those types of digital products. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say maybe is your biggest lesson learned from that experience? Oh, so gosh, let me think. I literally recorded a podcast episode that comes out next week where I share eight lessons. I'm almost like I need to pull that up because I like, I know it's like, we'll have to link to that. I know there's so many though. Um, I think one, I would say this is probably actually the biggest one. So I think in online business, especially people tell you, you have to have like an offer for everyone. So you need to have like your Ascension model and it needs to be like this lower cost offer. And then people move up it to like, you know, maybe there's a master on the top or, you know, whatever it is, you know, your course is more expensive. And it's like, you need something at every level. And you also need to serve all the people in your audience with a paid option. And that's great advice. Um, But you don't have to do that is like basically what I learned through this. Cause I, I think for me, it was like this membership was a solution to the fact that I have a podcast audience that wants to learn business that are not designers, which booked out designers for designers. Um, and then my templates mm-hmm. are for other business owners, but the, my templates are not business content. They're designs. And so I was like, okay, this will be me giving something to those people. And that I saw that gap as like a huge gap in my business. Like, oh, Elizabeth, you've got to fix that. Like it's anyone I talk to who's like a business coach, like Elizabeth, that's a problem. You need to fix that. And so this was like me fixing it. And I'm like, I realized now I'm like, no, I don't need to fill that gap. My podcast is filling that gap in a way and it's free yeah. and I can make money through advertisements and through the fact that people buy other things for me from hearing the podcast. So yeah, if you don't have to mm-hmm. have something for everyone, basically. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's a great lesson. And it actually leads me to my next question, which is I had a new coaching client start working with me a couple of weeks ago and she asked such a smart question on our first call. And she said, you know, what are some of the the qualities or the characteristics that you see 
coaches and creatives, the people that you're working with, like what are the similarities in the ones who end up building something sustainable mm-hmm. versus the ones who kind of crash and burn or kind of don't hit their goals or make it where they want to go? And one of them that I shared with her is this ability to be willing to try new things and to let trial and error kind of be a mindset that guides you and drives you forward. So it made me think, like, I think you must have that because you were willing to try something new and different and it wasn't the end of you. It didn't go like you thought it would. But can you speak a little bit to the value you see in that capacity to be willing to to try and fail? Mm -hmm. And that's such a great question she asked you because it's like, yeah, like that's a real thing. Um, Yeah, Mm -hmm. so I am into trying things and trying new things. Even like, you know, in a few weeks, I'm doing a sale. That's something I've never done before. And it's kind of interesting model for a sale. And it's like, yeah, I don't know if Mm -hmm. it'll go well. It might confuse people. I'm going to try to make it not, but I'm willing to just try. And if it doesn't work, I won't do it again. So I think about that a lot with things. But one question I like to ask is like, is there a way I can win from trying this, even if it fails. Um, and if the answer mm-hmm. is that you can win from it in some capacity, maybe it's that you're learning something, you're helping someone, you're realizing you don't want to do that thing, like that, that thing's not for you, then it's not actually a fail, even if it doesn't work out. Um, I think about that with yeah. something like starting a podcast. Like a lot of people want to start a podcast, but it feels super el- overwhelming. Like I can look at you, Becky, and be like, okay, she has like 250 episodes. Like, I don't know if I can do that. It's like, we'll try yeah. six episodes. And then maybe after those six episodes, you've gotten to meet some new people that now you're connected to. And now you know that you don't like podcasting, you know, it's like, whatever it is, it's like (laughs) that, that can be how it works. And that doesn't mean it's a fail. So um, that's a like important question to ask, I think. And I also am not a perfectionist, which is like, uh, in the designer world, especially, I feel like it's really common for people to wear a badge of honor of like, I'm a perfectionist. My work is like perfect. And I dot every I and cross every dot, every I cross every C, Um, which I do feel that way about my design specifically. You could say of like, I I'm pretty meticulous with templates of like making sure everything goes out well, but generally speaking in my business in areas that don't need it, I don't like stress over stuff. I'm not like spending a thousand years proofreading things, you know, I'm willing to delegate things and know that like, maybe I would have done it differently, but done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. I think that's helpful in like getting farther in your business. Yes. I was just going to ask you that too. So I, I imagine that that lack of perfectionism kind of consuming you did probably make it easier to outsource and delegate and grow a team. Would you think so? I think so, but it's gosh, it still is hard in a lot of ways. For me, a big thing with team has been like being in it for the long haul with someone that you've hired, like you trying to show up with that attitude. And therefore, because you're showing up with that attitude, when they do something you didn't like, or when you're giving direction, like, don't just like, you know, it can be so easy to like someone makes a graphic for you, you have a designer on your team, let's say, and you're like, you hate it, but it's like a good starting point. So you're just going to like redo it yourself. (laughs) You know, that's not the way to do it. Instead, like tell them what they need to change and let them do it. Or if you really want to change it yourself, I'll do something like recording a loom and saying like, Hey, this is great, but this is the stuff I'm changing. I want you to see for the future why I'm changing this um, and kind of teaching team members to like have the same vision and stuff. So I think that's helpful. And I've tried this year. I feel like I actually got feedback from a team member about this the other day of like really setting the vision for the team, because I think sometimes a solopreneur vibe people, which I have, my team's contractors, like I'm, I'm the only like employee in my business. So it's not like I'm to have this huge team of full-time people or anything like that, but because it does feel like it's mostly me solo in a lot of ways, it can be like so easy to be the only one that knows the vision and you're just like telling people what to do. Like that's how we can show up in Mm -hmm. our business. But I think it's really helpful to like cast that vision for your team. Even if maybe in your own head, you think like they're just a contractor. They don't really care what I'm trying to accomplish this year, but I think they do care more than you think. And it can be helpful to kind of Mm -hmm. put everyone on the same page, give everyone direction, excitement, all that. Yeah. I love that. And it probably makes them, you know, feel more bought in a sense of ownership over their work and like the contribution it's making. Yeah, totally. Um, 
Okay. Speaking of, so you said a lot of designers are perfectionists. You don't really see yourself in that category so much. And another area that I feel separates you is that you are a creative who likes spreadsheets. You like the numbers. And it makes me laugh because I am not that person. And a lot of my clients really aren't either. In fact, a lot of times, one of my first steps in working with some clients is actually making them look at their numbers because they haven't wanted to do that. But tell me a little bit about like, you love systems and processes. You, you know, have your profit. What is your profit sheet called again? Um, yeah, it's called profit sheet. That's literally the name of it. Yeah. Oh, it is. oh there we go. <laughs> yeah. So simple. It stuck with me. Yeah. Um, and have, has your personality always been that way? Kind of this creative yet systems oriented type personality? That's so kind of you to like say that. I'm so I don't like, I don't know. So I think I am a numbers person, but I'm also bad at math, even though I don't like saying I'm bad at things. That's like, feels like a little bit of a growth mindset problem, but really yeah. I'm not like naturally gifted at math. I even realized at one point, like, maybe a year ago, I was like, I'm not good at quick math. Like I wish I was. And I got an app on my phone where I was like doing math problems to like try to help me get better at math because it is like, I do like numbers, but I'm also forget numbers really easily and need calculators for like little things sometimes. Um, (laughs) But I am a systems person. I like systems and processes. Um, I feel like if I wasn't a designer, I can enjoy being like an online business manager, honestly. Like I like doing that aspect of business. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess I would say maybe it is something that's been with me a while because when I think back on before I started my business, even back to like middle school and high school, the like computer science side of things has always been something I've been drawn to. Um, Mm -hmm. and like as my business has grown, doing more of the like CEO stuff is not so upsetting to me. Like I like being creative, but I also like doing other types of things, which is helpful. And it is so important to look at your numbers. And, um, I feel like I both have a good hand on that, but also forget numbers so easily. Like I'll like do my business finances for the month. And then my husband, Adam will be like, so how much did you make? And I like, I already forgot. I'm like, I don't remember. I just (laughs) saw it on like this, on this like profit and loss and in my notes, but like, I don't remember. I'll think I'll look it up. So it's like, that's kind of more how I show up with it all. Yes. (laughs) Well, I think I too kind of bridge the like right brain, left brain somewhat. Yeah. I remember sharing with someone that my favorite classes in high school were art and math. And somebody was like, I don't understand how that works. <laughs> and I, so I have liked the math piece, but I would say like, I don't, I'm not as passionate about the systems and processes stuff, but I envy those who are. So I think it's really cool that you have that skill set in your wheelhouse. Yes. Um Okay, so I always am I'm constantly talking to clients and on the podcast here about sin of life and business. And I feel like there are there are growth seasons, there are maintenance seasons, there are seasons of rest. How would you describe the season that you find yourself and your business in right now? Mm, I love those ways of like defining the seasons. So right now, it's interesting. I would say right now, like literally like today, I'm in like a growth season. But right before that, I was in a maintenance season. And right before that, I was in Mm -hmm. a rest season where I took like five, a five month maternity leave when my son was born. So it's been like, and right right before that, I was in a growth season. Like I was hustling during that pregnancy, Mm -hmm. like getting um, booked out designer launched and like launching new temples, all kinds of things. So it's been a very like ebb and flow with me there. But right now, it does feel like I've gotten into a good work pace um, and a good childcare situation to where it has been like, okay, I have some good vision for my business. I'm focused on these things and I'm focused on growth. But I'm also mm-hmm. like, as I'm anticipating having another baby, I'm going to be heading into a rest and then a maintenance season and then a growth season again. So it's like, it'll kind of have that same ebb and flow, which is so helpful to think about of not feeling the pressure of being in the same season as someone else and like seeing what Mm -hmm. they're doing and reminding yourself, Hey, they're doing that. But like, like you said, like you're in a rest season, you're in a maintenance season or whatever it is. So I love those terms. Yes. Yeah. How far out looking at next year and the arrival of baby number two, like, the planner mind 
in you, how far out will you start backtracking of what the months leading up to that are? And maybe you have already. I don't know. <laughs> oh my gosh, Becky. So I literally have already in ClickUp, which is what <laughs> I, I use that as that's like our business project management tool. But I have um, an area that's like Elizabeth only. And I actually did. It's a really, I like the way I set it up. It's like I start at like from one month and two months and three months, like through the months of pregnancy. And I put tasks in of like, okay, this is something I need to make sure happens by this point. Mm -hmm. And it's a mix of personal things. Like my office is going to come to nursery and my office is going to be moved up a floor. And so like things like that, um, okay. to things like batching podcast episodes of like, oh yeah, this would be a good month to do a week of batch interviews mm -hmm. and things like that. So I do like thinking ahead about it. And I want to take another longer maternity leave because I feel like, you know, why have a business if you're not going to like take advantage of like the flexibility it offers us. And so I'm like, yeah. you know, and I, and my business can like still work with me doing that. So I feel excited about that, but it does take mm -hmm. a lot of planning to do it. Yes. And that brings me to kind of the next question, which is, your business really took off before you started your family. And I'm guessing that you had a lot of ways that you kind of got used to doing life and business and how you worked and how you thought about your time and all the things. How so far, almost two years in, have you seen motherhood change the way that you're making decisions, the way you're showing up and how you're just showing up both, I guess, in life and in your business. Yeah, it changes things so much, like more than I thought it was going to. Um, and I'm grateful to know business without having a child and business with, because I I feel like I have mm -hmm. so much more empathy and also like maybe more helpful to women who are starting businesses after um, like having kids already. Because now I'm like, oh yeah, I get this more when before yeah. I didn't, because I only knew what it looked like to have a business without children. But mm -hmm. um Anyway, I feel like what's changed, gosh, I I thought I was like productive before, but I feel like I'm more productive now, which I feel like I hear all moms say frequently, but I also am less productive in some ways. Like I, my mind is more split between things and it used to be like my business mm -hmm. was kind of my baby. And I was like, no, my business is not my baby. I have like a literal baby. <laughs> like it's like, they, they can't both <laughs> like hold that position. Um, so I feel like yes. it's like, I'm both more productive, but I also feel like I have more days where I'm like, okay, I have childcare right now and I'm actually not going to work because like I have all these things like I do around the house that like I don't get to do when I'm taking care of my son. And I also feel like in terms of the values, I value time away from work more than ever because yeah. before it was like work and life were so connected when I didn't have anyone mm -hmm. else to take care of. And it was just kind of like, oh yeah, I can like, sure, I'll go on that trip. Sure, I'll do like whatever, you know, sure, I'll work a little bit later tonight. But I feel like I value the time spent with Colin more and which means valuing the time I am working more. Than maybe I was before yeah. and also feel like I have more goals to like work less and be like, how can I be more intentional with my time to work less hours versus before I feel like in some ways I showed up, especially early in my business, which is not a bad way to show up early in your business if you're able to, but I showed up a bit more of like, how much time can I put towards this? And it was intentional time, Yeah, but it was like, I was like, okay, let me try yeah. to like put some hours into this. And now I'm more like, what ways can I get smarter? to put less hours to this so I can be like home. Well, I'm always home working from home, but home with my son more. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, I saw a, a quote, I guess, or maybe more of a statistic I saw somewhere and I, I wish I knew where it was, but it was maybe a month or so ago. And it said that a mom who is working part-time hours is more productive than the average full-time employee. And I thought, like, I could totally see why, because something does shift when you have a finite amount of time. Like you said, when you aren't a mom and you are working for yourself, there is very few, like the only boundaries between your work hours and your personal hours are ones that you set, right? And so that makes so much sense that when you suddenly have you know, X number of hours and you really value that time and you know what has to happen to make the most of it, I think your productivity completely changes. And even I challenged myself a couple of months ago, you know, I was thinking, okay, I tend to work during the kids' school day, but I, I think it's, I may have this wrong. I think it might be Parkinson's law that they yeah. refer to it as like, 
you need the exact amount of time you give yourself. Yeah. If you give yourself five hours, it'll take five. Okay. So my thought was, I'm going to see if I can get all of my work done before noon, not like stretch it out until school got out. I'm, gonna, like, I'm just going to see. And it was so awesome because you know, I kind of loosely continued to do it until the school year was over, but it was so fun because at 12, I had accomplished everything I wanted to get done. And then I had this few hours that I could work on something fun or go outside. And it's not like I don't work those things into my day in general, but it's so fascinating what happens though, when you're super intentional with those work hours. Yeah. I love that idea of doing that type of challenge. And I need to do some of that more because it can be hard for me on childcare days to not just feel like I need to work the whole time I have childcare versus being like, oh, you know, this is yes. a great time to go to the gym or go on a walk or spend more time journaling or whatever, make plans with a friend. Yes. Um, so I still feel like I'm yeah. navigating a lot of that, but I love that idea. I have a client recently who we were walking through how many hours she's working and has childcare. And I said, hey, I just want to check in with you. Like, do you feel like you might be working too much and kind of, are you maybe not necessarily requiring all of those hours to reach your goals or maybe could you be using them in a different way? And I think that's really important to remember because sometimes as a mom, especially with really little ones, just having that adult time or that time to yourself to think adult things and work on the things you really love can be such a blessing, Mm -hmm. but then it can kind of be like, it can easily, I think sometimes cross the line too of like, wait, Originally, I said I wanted to kind of work this many hours. Like, does that still feel like where I want to be? Because it can be easy to kind of, if you have childcare available too, I think it can be easy to be like, oh, well, this is pretty nice. Like, and then to reassess, like, okay, where does this fall in the big picture scope of like where I want to be with family time and work hours and all the things? Yeah, which that's where it's like so important to have, like, especially in our business, like time where you're just like, okay, I'm thinking about what's next, what makes sense, what I'm doing versus just like going through life, just doing all the things. I feel like that actually bring it back Mm -hmm. to the membership. That was part of my problem then. I was like so exhausted and also like so busy between, we did not have childcare at that point. We were just both like taking care of Colin back and forth. And so it was like, I feel like I didn't think it through as well because of that. Cause it was like, nope, I've just I had my hands in too many different places. I needed some of that time yeah. to just sit and be like, oh, let me just map out my business for like the next year. And I wasn't really doing that. Yeah. So in the season you find yourself right now, can you tell us what a typical Monday through Friday looks like for you? Because how we run the back ends of our businesses, I think it, it's kind of fun to see the the realistic look at what someone's week does look like. Yeah, I love hearing people's answers to this type of question. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, Colin goes to a preschool Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and he typically gets dropped off around eight and picked up at four. And right now, the one we use go to is like 15 minutes from our house. So driving all that, those are kind of like my work hours those days. And right now I do work basically that whole time with, of course, a lunch break. And I'll take a break to like work out and go on a walk and things like that. But that's, those are like my main work days. And that's typically when I'm trying to schedule meetings. Um, and also I try to always keep at least one of those days completely empty with no meetings so that I can really do like deep work on something in the business. Um, and then on Tuesday and Thursday, my husband and I alternate where one of those days he'll be with Colin all day and one day I'll be with Colin all day. And that was something that like okay. when we thought about being in this like season of little kids, which is another one of the way, but Colin being little, we both knew that like we didn't want to both work full time and do full time childcare. And we also knew that neither of us wanted to be a full time stay at home parent. And so we have both kind of yeah. worked our work to where we can both have a day with Colin all day, like doing the stay at home parent thing. And then also, Mm-hmm. a day working in that mix. But for me still, even with that being true, Tuesday and Thursdays are both kind of like weird because like today we're recording this on Thursday. And right now Adam is with Colin and took him to Whole Foods to do an Amazon return. Um, but like <laughs> right before that, for like the hour before we just hopped on this interview, I was playing with Colin. So it's like, I kind of like, yeah. it's like kind of like I might work like maybe four hours, maybe three hours on the day like that. So I don't know. It depends. But yeah, that's kind of what the overarching week looks like from a childcare perspective. And then I'm not someone who has like, 
I kind of wish I was. I always think it sounds cool when I hear people talk about it, but I don't have like a Mondays are this day, Tuesdays are this day. It's more like changes week over week, but I do feel very strongly about it. It's super helpful to me to plan my week of like, here's what I'm working on this week. Here's when meetings are Mm -hmm. planning meetings strategically. So you don't have just like little one hour gaps where you never do get anything done, but like, you know, batching meetings together on the same day or close together and things like that. But I use the full focus planner, which is like a printed planner Mm -hmm. combined with my Apple calendar to plan the week. And I keep like a rolling kind of like to-do list and map of the day in my full focus planner. That really helps me. Would you say when you talk about planning your week, do you take like one sit down time and map out what your priorities are for that week and kind of what days you want to get stuff done? Or are you more likely to have the list of what's important this week and every day when it's time to work, you kind of sit down and think about what you feel like doing that day. Because I know as a creative, like you don't always have all the ideas (laughs) and you don't always feel like doing certain times of work. So kind of which bucket do you fall? Uh, So I do both. It really truly depends on the week. And I feel like I'm my most productive self when I do the whole like planning at the beginning of the week. Okay. This is what I'm doing Monday. This is what I'm doing Tuesday and like mapping out like that. And that's actually when I do that, that's when I make sure I get things done that are for my own self care, like working out, journaling, Mm -hmm. having a long quiet time and things like that. Cause that's when I'm like, okay, like I'm going to fit that in. Um, and then you also see that like maybe all your work things don't take as long as you realize when you do that. So I'm a big fan of like trying, writing out your task list, then putting it on a calendar allotted amounts of time. Um, I think that's hugely helpful. I, I feel like I do that less because life has changed since becoming a mom. And so sometimes it's like, like, yeah, like I, I was supposed to between this meeting with you and the meeting I had before when that one hour was playing with Colin, I was supposed to be recording something for a team member to teach them how to do something. It's like, yeah, I didn't get to do that because like mom life happens. So it's like, and that's okay. And I I love being able to be flexible with that. So yeah, I think it's helpful though, when I do the mapping out, but I'm with you though. And like, I could tell myself like, okay, on this day, I'm going to record three solo podcasts and outline all of them. But then when the day comes, it could be like, no, I'm not feeling like creative in that way. And so I'd want to be able to move it. And that's the great thing about being an entrepreneur though. You can like, you can make the plan and then you also can say like, wait, no, this doesn't make sense today. So yes, yes. I love that too. And I feel like I'm kind of a hybrid. Like I have certain days, like certain days of the week that I only schedule calls, whether they're client calls or podcast interviews. And then I have some days of the week that are a little bit more loose and a little bit more, I can kind of not wing it, but like kind of just decide like, okay, of these things, what I feel like doing most today and kind of going from there. So I like the option to do that, especially If, um, you know, on Mondays, I'm usually creating podcast episodes, but, you know, if I don't have an idea or if I didn't have, you know, no, I have a plan for what I was going to sit down and work on, it's nice that I can kind of move those things around. And if it's more, if I'm in a place where it's more, you know, makes more sense to look at my inbox or deal with something else or reply to something that needs my attention, I love having that mix of, you know, there's intentional things that I know I want to happen, but I also just check in with like how I'm feeling because I know that I'm going to be most efficient with that time when I'm kind of in the zone of whatever that type of work involves. So I'm with you. I love that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about faith. I love talking about this. You shared in your introduction of yourself that you are a Christian and I just love talking with women of faith about business, especially when, you know, it's not like you are, um, you know, in your marketing, you are focusing on Christian business owners or niched down in that way. But I'd love to talk about just how do you see your faith influencing the kind of business that you've built? Hmm. That's a good question. And yeah, it is. It's like, I don't run a ministry, you know, I'm not trying to run a ministry and you're right. Like I'm not, it's also like, I don't have a business angle. That's like, this is for Christian women. And I think that a lot of people who are Christian business owners get in the mindset that if you're not doing like one of those things, then you shouldn't talk about your faith because you're not Mm -hmm. targeting just Christians or you're not doing a ministry and, you know, doing Bible studies and things like that. It's like, but there is like, I don't know, I guess my perspective is like, 
God's called me to this work. And I truly believe that. Like, I feel so called to in what I do in my business. And I love it so much, but also feel like it, like, is a calling from God. And I also think that as Christians, like, we all are called to minister to people, not just people who are literal ministers. And our businesses are a great way to do that. Like everyone listening has a platform in some way. And I know for me, I just, I felt like convicted at times of like, I know that I have some things to say about faith. And I do have like, especially with like my podcast, like that is a platform that you can talk about and like share about God in some ways. And I like to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and then also when I think about like, other ways of integrating faith that are not as direct as like a podcast episode that shares scripture. I just try to like show up ethically as a business owner and also like showing, it sounds so cheesy. I almost like can't say it, but showing like God's love to people through like (laughs) selling them like websites and stuff and like just providing like a really great customer experience and serving people well and being like some, a brand you can trust and things like that. And just, I don't know, that's, that's kind of how I see and praying for, um, customers and clients has always been like a big thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, That's how I think about it. Yeah. I love that you shared that. Um, I really, I see motherhood and business both as forms of ministry that we are called to. And I think it's true just as you described, even if you aren't directly, um, operating as a Christian business or for Christian entrepreneurs or whatever that looks like. I think that how you show up matters and people notice, people notice integrity, people notice kindness. And unfortunately, it's not always all that common in the world that we live in. And I love that that alone, just how you choose to show up and operate can be such a, you know, just a a point of, of attention for people like something's different about her. And then, you know, maybe leaning in or like, I want to learn a little bit more about her. Like, I want to check out some other stuff she's doing. And I think that that can be such an invitation and so, you know, indirect and so subtle, but so influential. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I love that. In addition to motherhood and business, both being forms of ministry, I think they are some of the most significant ways that God can shape and grow and refine us. So I'm curious, what are some of the, the ways that you see God working through you personally, through motherhood and through business? Mm, That's a good question. Gosh, um, motherhood, a big one is learning to trust God, like for real. Um, I feel like I, so for real, for real. <laughs> like, cause we can all say we trust God, but it's like, do you really, when it like comes down yes. to it? Um, yes. for me, yes. when I was pregnant with Colin, I was so like bent on like, I am going to have an unmedicated birth at a birth center. And I was just like, yes. this is going to be, I remember yeah. This. And it was like, I was, I took all the birth classes. I read all the books and I was just, I was really excited about it. I was just, I don't know. It was just like, and I, it was a, it was a little bit of a fear in me too. It's like, I want this so bad. It has to happen. I'm like forcing it to happen. And God wants this for me too. And, um, you know, I read a book that was all about like, um, pain-free childbirth and like things like that. I was just very into all that. And then I go to like, I go past my due date. Um, I get told I have to get induced at a hospital, which was like everything I was trying to avoid. Um, they did practically every intervention except for a C-section. And I had a 44 hour labor, um, that was just really, really taxing in just about every way. Mm-hmm. And all of that was just like a big, like, I, like thing about just trusting God. I, even though if I say all that, it's like, wait, how does I have to do trusting God? But like in those moments of like when everything felt like it was falling apart, all my plans, we had gone out the door and literally everything mm-hmm. opposite of my plans was what happened. <laughs> um, and then being like, <laughs> it's okay. Like I gave birth to a healthy baby and I, I don't know. I just, just, I like look back at that birth experience as like learning to trust God. And even like I had a scripture that was like, kind of like my scripture for my birth. And I thought it applied to like being in a birth center because like, it was just like, oh yeah, this is going to be like my birth. Yeah. I don't know. I, but I had, yes, a, like you had the vision. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, it, it was the scripture in Matthew about God taking care of the wild flowers. Won't he care for you? That, that whole scripture. And, um, it was just yes. a really cool thing. I still remember when I was in the like depths of just like, is this baby ever going to come out? Just please someone take him out. Cause I'm dying over here. <laughs> um, the artwork in my labor and delivery room was 
a bunch of wildflowers, dandelions specifically, on the wall. And it was just like, I remember having a moment like, okay, God, you are still here. You're teaching me to like trust you with this instead of feeling like, oh, I have to hold everything so tightly in my own hands. So um, I feel like I've done that in life at times with God without realizing mm -hmm. it. And that was like, oh, yeah, like, no, I was not trusting you fully. I was saying, I only trust you if it goes with my plan. Yes, um, so that yeah. was really big for me. Yes. What would you say is your favorite thing about this particular season of life and business? Ooh, okay. So with life, I would say getting to be just home a lot with Colin and like being able to work less. And he's just so fun. Like mm -hmm. right now he's almost two. And I think that's at least right now, like a really fun age for us. And so yes. it's just funny <laughs> to talk to him now and like all of that. And then in business, what is real favorite thing? Um, I would say one thing is like basically reaping the rewards from what I built and being able to like work a bit less and still see things grow. Um, and also like I've been mm -hmm. creating lots of new templates right now and that's just really, really fun for me of like getting into like creation mode and new templates that don't exist mm -hmm. yet in the show with space and like, um, just exploring all different kinds of things there has been really fun. And what do you feel is the hardest and most challenging things right now? with both motherhood and business? Uh, I would say being, feeling like stretched thin sometimes and like I'm not good at managing, managing my time because of that. Um, mm -hmm. Especially right now being pregnant again, just being like tired um, yeah. with the motherhood and work combo. And I just got done breastfeeding right before getting pregnant again. So I only had about two okay. months between breastfeeding and being pregnant again. And it was like, so I feel like I'm just tired. It's basically like <laughs> how I would yeah. say it. Of like, well, your body's been pretty busy. <laughs> yes. And so I think that's been like a hard thing, but, but also like, I know this isn't forever. And it's like, you have a lot of perspective with that of like, Hey, this is not, I, I'm not planning to have a hundred children. And so this is not going to be like yes. breastfeeding nursing for like a thousand years. But, um, yeah, that's been hard and just feeling like, stretch thin some. Um, and also navigating, mm -hmm. like growing a team has been a thing in business for me, really defined from like, honestly, this point last year to like this point this year of just like figuring out like, where do I actually need help besides the obvious core things, like having someone to edit your podcast mm -hmm. and like having help with customer support yeah. that are like, in my, in my business, like, yes, those are like no brainers. But then there are other things where it's like, wait, should I be doing that? Should, else do it? should this person be doing the same, th that person's job? It's like, that's that whole like mind map of like what it goes where has been like a hard thing. <laughs> I can imagine. When you think about the year ahead, I know personally you have this big thing to look forward to with a sibling for Colin, but business wise, is there anything coming on the horizon that you are doing differently or that's going to be new or is it more just optimizing what you are doing currently? I would say optimizing what I'm doing currently, which has been like a good thing for me though. Like I'm, I've had seasons where I feel like, you know, as business owners, we can be so idea oriented that it's like, you're always wanting to launch the next thing instead of just working on, on what's already there. So I feel like I've been in like a working on what's already there season this whole year so far. And that's been really good for me of like, Hey, I'm not going to like create some new offer right now, but I'm going to optimize, like you said, you know, the things I already do have and also optimizing like team, so that's felt really exciting. And I just, I said, sorry, but like, you know, making new templates has been exciting for me. And I'm always excited about my podcast, which I know you love podcasting too. So that's something yes. that's just like always there in the background and like uh, something I look forward to every time I like record. Yes, totally relate. So I think the last question I have for you is when you think about this eight years of business, what has maybe been the most surprising or unexpected way that you've seen God work through this business that he gave you to steward and to put out into the world? Oh, that's a good question. Oh my gosh. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm not going to answer with like the best answer off the top of my head, but okay. I know I'm trying to think, cause I feel like there's so many like little ways. Um, so I guess one thing I would say is just being able to help, especially through booked out designer, see other people, other women specifically, it's mostly who's in booked out designer, but like see them be able to start and grow a business and like create income for their family and 
quit a job they didn't like and all that because I decided to like make a course that I did feel like called by God to make. So I feel like that's been cool. Of just like, it almost yeah. feels like other worldly sometimes of like, wait, oh yeah, like you're saying that that the course helped you with that. Like, oh wait, like that, I, mean, I made that course. You know, it's like that, that kind of moment that happens yeah. to me often. Of like, oh wait, that's cool. And seeing like with, you know, my website yes. templates, like such a huge thing as a business owner is like when you feel that date that you officially call, like the day you started your business. And when I think about when I started my mm -hmm. business, you know, we were saying earlier, like I freelanced for a while without a website, without a professional email, without social media. And then I, I yeah. like the date in my phone that I'm like, oh yeah, this is the recurring date. That's when I started my business. That date is based on the day I launched my website and like I've made it a official and said like, Hey, the, I'm out here now. Come check out what I'm offering. And so it feels cool now all these years later to be like, Oh yeah. Like I see all the time people doing that same step with my templates. That's really cool. Yes. That's so awesome. When you think back to the beginning year or two of your business after you had started the website, I feel like from the outside, it looks like everything really kind of took off quickly. Did it feel that way to you though at the time? No, I don't think it did. I do feel like I got clients quickly, which was a, like sometimes unique thing, sometimes not. But I, I do feel like I got clients quickly. Um, I feel like things really started to take off for me though, in terms of bookings when I niche down to branding and websites. Mm -hmm. And then even more specifically, a little while later, maybe like eight months later from then I switched to show it from WordPress. And then I feel like things really took off for ah. me there because I became a better designer on show it, like show it gives you more yeah. creative freedom. And, you know, with WordPress, I was more like, I could do cool things because I do know some coding and I was using a good builder, but like I would, especially with custom work was like trying to make it where clients can update themselves. And like, I don't know, I feel like I ran into more headaches there. So I feel like that's when I think about like things starting to take off. And I went through, three different yeah. names in my business. So even more specifically, when I finally just went back, like went to like, okay, I'm just going to call my business my own name. I think that also was helpful for me. Yes. Yes. I know you can't ever go wrong like <laughs> with your name because nobody who's going to see, I mean, I guess somebody could steal that if there's multiple yeah. people out there with your name, but you know, it's much more unlikely. Well, I feel so. like normally <laughs> you see more so people start out with their name and then change to something else. But I was like the opposite of like, two different, very different made up names and then being like, okay, fine. I'll just use my own name. Like, yeah, it's just going to yeah. work better for me long term. So <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, I just want to say thank you for spending time with us and sharing part of your story here today. I, I admire, I've told you this before, but I admire so much about how you show up as a business owner and the integrity and the authenticity that you show up with, even though I don't love the word authenticity because I think it can be overused. But thank you for taking the time to chat today. It's fun to talk about the journey where you started and where you are now. And I know that hearing this is going to be such a blessing to so many who are listening. Oh, thank you. And I love talking with you. I need to have you on the podcast again for like a round two. That would be fun. Yeah, I would love it. Last but not least, where would you like to direct people who maybe haven't connected with you online before, but want to get to know more about Elizabeth? Yeah. So you can go search for the Breakthrough Brand Podcast. If you go back, I want to say it's like around episode 40 or something. We can link to your episode, but you were on the podcast. Yes. And that was such a good episode. Like I still remember being like, we were, it was about minds as a business owner, but that podcast yes. has some interviews, but it's mainly a lot of solo episodes. And um, I talk about marketing, I talk about productivity, I talk about what's not working and what is working in my own business. I talk about faith um, for business mm -hmm. owners and um, yeah, all kinds of stuff like that. And then other things, if you need a show website template, like look at my shop, <laughs> Yes. And then if you're a designer, um, check out book.designer would be a, a good move. You'll find a lot of people there who are obsessed with Becky. So like, cause you've been a coach in there for so many different coaching yes, calls. Yes. So people in there love you. So you'll be in like good hands with like-minded people. <laughs> yes. So good. Awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that. And again, one last time, just thanks for hopping on and chatting with me today. It's been so fun to just reconnect and also um, just to kind of talk about all the things that I'm so excited to see where your business takes you next, where your family growing. It's such an exciting season. Yeah, thank you, Becky. Hey, thank you for listening to the podcast today. That just flew by, didn't it? 
If you enjoyed the episode, then I want to invite you to check out my online course and coaching program for designers, Booked Out Designer. In this program, I teach you how to build a successful in-demand booked out business as a designer. You'll learn everything from the exact experience I take clients through to things like figuring out your niche, mastering discovery calls, pricing your services for profit, attorney drafted contract templates, my exact social media strategies to book clients, and so much more. You even get to watch recordings of me in meetings with actual clients. We take things you're learning on this podcast and so many things I've actually never even covered on the show and dive way deep into them. In addition to the amazing course with nine modules of teaching and over 90 lessons, you also get group coaching calls with me and access to an exclusive Facebook community of designers just like you. To get info and join the course, head to elizabethmccravey.com slash B-O-D, short for Booked Out Designer. That's elizabethmccravey.com slash B-O-D. Designers all over the world and in all different niches are having insane wins from this program, and I would love to help you do the same. That's Booked Out Designer, found at elizabethmccravey.com slash B-O-D. Okay, that's it. Can't wait to connect with you again next week. Bye, friend.